with us today is Roz Jones. You may remember her from the Paperwork Isn't Sexy, But It's Important episode. And today we're discussing telehealth doctor appointments versus in-person doctor appointments. So thanks for joining us again today, Roz. Thank you so much for having me back. Uh, I, I love I, I love the last time we were together and every time we get together, it's, it's better and better. Well, we'll just have to keep doing it. Then I know you've got a <laughs> list of things we could talk about. It's just oh, uh, never ending, oh, yeah. which is good for me, but I don't know if it's necessarily great for the rest of the world, but <laughs> you know, I hope someday they find a cure for Alzheimer's and put me out of business. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Well, I saw what the FDA just uh, approved a new medication. Yeah, there's a lot of controversy around it. So I've actually talked to have an episode that where I talked to two neurologists who are in favor of it. They're ordering it for their practice. They feel mm. like this is a step towards more and better. Good. They, under, they understand the concerns. Mm -hmm. they, they don't downplay them. And then I talked to another gentleman who um, is the creator of Neural Reserve, the memory the mm -hmm. brain supplement, mm -hmm. and he feels that it's a positive step. He thinks the pharmaceutical company that created it is, he does not like their pricing. Mm. Which, okay. You know, and he's former ph pharmaceutical gentleman, so that was kind of nice. We, I asked him off, we weren't recording, I wish we'd recorded it, because the short answer was very long, so <laughs> it was a very good answer, but I didn't get it recorded, so now I just have to repeat it for everybody. But he feels we will end up with like a lifestyle and drug cocktail to deal oh, with okay. Alzheimer's. So it's like, okay. okay, well, I plan on being around for, you know, another 48, 49 years. Be like my paternal grandmother who lived to 103. So that'll be, uh, you know, I get to, I'll, I'll be able to see what happens, I hope. That's my plan. Right, right. <laughs> So while I wait on my doctor to call me back, they didn't couldn't do a telehealth appointment for me today, apparently. Why don't we talk about the difference, the pros and cons and the differences, why we might want to do one versus the other? Well, with with one versus the other during COVID, it was great because it, 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 it reduced the opportunity for any type of infection. It reduced the opportunity, of course, for stress. Uh, and then what's so good about it is that the doctors were able to come into the environment where the patient was. So that's twofold. Uh, you, you know, you get to see if they're being treated correctly, if there's any abuse, any neglect, you know, because by law we have to report and the doctors would have to report. So it's a good thing. And then also, too, when you take someone to the doctor, sometimes their blood pressure goes up. So you may get a misreading on, on blood pressure. I'm laughing because my blood pressure always <laughs> went up when I had to deal with my mom and the doctor. Okay. So, um, you know, go figure. Why would somebody's blood pressure go up? So, you know, so those are the good things about telehealth. Uh, you know, then the next good thing is, is that, okay, we don't have to pack a lunch. We don't have to pre-plan. We got to get the wheelchair in the car. We got to get the person in the car. We got to pack diapers, pull-ups, wipes, an extra pair of pants, a bib, a snack. It's a whole situation. That is true. It, however, however, you know, that's the, you know, the good side. The, the bad side of that is, is that then we don't get the person out of the house. Uh, you know, you know, COVID was very bad. Uh, and, and, and I can say this about one of my clients. They don't mind because I talk about her all the time. Miss Helen, Miss Helen was walking very well before COVID. And then because she lived in a, a facility, they locked everybody down to rooms. You couldn't come out and eat. You couldn't come out and walk the hall. So her walking was restricted to her apartment. And so now we have to do continuous physical therapy to try to get her back to where she was. So now since everything has been opening up, probably what, since March or April, we have been doing weekly physical therapy. So Telehealth was good, but it's, it also it also can be bad because, you know, it, it, it limits the person from going outside, you know, um, convenience. Yes. Good. Not all the time. And then, you know, they want to get out, outside too. being in that house all day long, cabin fever, depression, anxiety. 
So there's a lot of bad things about being inside all the time. Everybody wants to get out. Even an animal wants to get out of the cage. That's true. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, the bad thing is, is that they don't get, to, you know, the, the, the client doesn't get to get out. They don't get to interact with other people. Uh, you know, so there's, you know, there's pros and cons to it. But, you know, uh, the, the pro is, is if that someone is bedridden and can't get out, that's where we really need telehealth. If someone can still get out, even though it may be a minor inconvenience to pack all of that stuff, let's make it a field trip. Let's make it a day trip. Let's do something all day together. So instead of it being like, okay, it's a drudgery, you know, let's make it a field trip. With my client and everybody knows that Miss Helen loves a pretty good Bloody Mary. <laughs> so our doctor's visit turns into an alcohol run. <laughs> Does Miss Helen have cognitive impairment or she just she, she has a little bit of cognitive impairment, a little bit, but you know, when it's time to go to the doctor, she can, you know, the first thing she said, are we gonna stop and get my bloody Mary? So her <laughs> cognitive is not too bad. <laughs> She's remembering the important things, apparently. <laughs> the important things. You know, so um, yes, some of it has declined. She's 93, you know, and we know some of the short-term memory. It's gone, but the long-term memory and some other things that have gone on, she is still sharp as a tack. So, you know, there's good and bad with the telehealth medicine versus going into an office. And, you know, going into the office, if you can time it right, you can get in and don't have to sit long. But if it's one of those days, <sighs> I've had those days where we've gone in and we've had to sit and sit and sit. <laughs> That's how it was with my mom's neurologist. She was fantastic. She spent lots of time with us and uh -huh. other patients. Exactly. But you know how they always tell you, be here 15 minutes before your appointment. It's like, uh-uh. Nope, we'll be here about five minutes before. We will check in, and I will ask you how far behind the doctor is, and then we will go across the parking lot to Starbucks or the hamburger joint next door, and we will get something to drink, maybe something to nibble on, and you can text me when it's time to start wandering back across the parking lot because my mom did not did not wait patiently in that neurologist's office because she, you know, had no clue how long we'd been sitting there. And, right. you know, an hour was forever for me. I have no clue what it felt like to her. But her general physician was really good. Uh, they cranked people through pretty quickly, which. And, then, and then another thing you can do, too, is before you go, what paperwork needs to be updated? Do you need to update it? insurance card because you know the insurance cards when they come out in uh december january do we need to sign any paperwork in advance can we do it before we get there because a lot of times you know and i know things are supposed to be electronic now because they get a, a little kickback if everything is electronic but if there's some things we can do in advance to getting there to cut down that waiting time is huge it's huge so you know those are you know some of the pros and cons of either being at, you know, for them coming there versus, you know, them going in. But I think depending on who the person is that's taking care of it and the diagnosis will determine uh, the pros and the cons of telehealth medicine. I think telehealth would have been a lot better with my mom, although we always seem to have to do um, urinary tests. Right. You know, which that's a little tricky to do on the computer. Yeah, because right. Because she would just get she would she would just get uncooperative. Mm -hmm. And you know, and you say, Well, make it a field trip, and it was she would get so frustrated and irritated over the whole process, even though I would try to keep it very relaxed, that by the time we got done with the doctor, it was all I could do to like get her back in the car, get her back to the memory care residence because we were done with each other. Yeah, it, came, it was like an act, act of God. I know. <laughs> well, and the doctors were, her general physician was not real good at, there was one day, you know, my listeners know I'm a cyclist. I went out, I go out Wednesday, Fridays with a group. I came mm -hmm. home, it was a Friday morning, decided, you know what? I've had a busy week. I did a nice bike ride, but I kind of cut it a little bit short so I could go home, shower, dress, have lunch, and then just work. And I'd gotten out of the shower and the doctor called and they're, well, the doctor's office called and I'm like, doctor needs to see your mother today. It's 1140. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm like, honey, for what? I'm like, well, we, th he, we think he, we need to do a um, ultrasound. 
And you're going to do that in your office? Well, he wants to see her first. Why? I mean, I just went round and round. And I'm like, I really don't have time for this today. You don't? Like, give me a break. <laughs> like, like, 52 years old, people. I'm not, not retired yet, okay? And even if I was, I was very offended that they just assumed I could drop everything. I said, my mom is like 15 minutes away. I have to get in my car. I have to, first off, I have to call them, prep her, you know, prep them to prep her. Right, then I got to go right. over there and drive over there. Then I got to drive back because you people are literally down the hill from my house. And I said, you know. We're talking about at least two hours before I get there. Well, yeah. It's just, well, th so then they're like, okay, well, ba basically they wanted me to go into the doctor so that we, I don't know, we could make an appointment for an ultrasound. Long story short, they said, well, here, I, I literally spent six hours, six hours? Yeah, about six hours, 13 different phone calls trying to schedule the ultrasound for her because when they called me, it was like, okay, blah, 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 do this, do that, the other thing, and call us back. But it was lunchtime. I'm like, you people, you know, and you couldn't just call back the office. You had to call the, I don't know what it is. It was just like, by the time I finally got the office on the phone, and I've, I have normally outgrown this, but I lost my cool. I was yelling as being completely unreasonable. And I knew I was being unreasonable, but I was so upset and so stressed out and so angry that it was like, you know, we just are going to just, you know, we're just going to go through the motions and we don't care how it impacts you, the caregiver, or how it impacts your mother. Exactly. It was awful, you know, and then Which of course she passed away and then like, Within a month, I got an email from the doctor's office like, oh, we're doing telehealth appointments. Like, I don't think that will do her any good at this point. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, the, uh, another thing that's good about telehealth, the, some of the uh, geriatric services have what's, what's called concierge. So, you know, they have someone that can come in and draw the blood versus them going to like a quest or whoever to get the blood drawn. They have someone that can come out and do a, uh, uh, EKG, do an x-ray, you know, that, so a lot of this stuff now is portable, which is wonderful because to take and put a 93 year old woman up on a table to get an x-ray. Oh my God. Yeah. We did that <laughs> with my mom. Oh boy. Cause my mom had fallen and right. like she fell December 30th, 2019. And she had a normal scheduled neurology appointment on January 6th. So a week. And I thank God showed up early. You know, it's just like, basically my time management was so good that I ended up extra early to pick her up. And it was great because it took forever for her to walk out of the memory residence because she would take two steps and wince in pain. And I'm like, this is not normal. And I told the, the, we ended up going to the urgent care because we were so <laughs> early. And the urgent care was downstairs from the neurologist, which thankfully that medical office complex was literally like five minutes from where my mom lived. So the, oh, okay. It wasn't too bad, but they don't have any parking spaces for people who walk really slow, which my, my mom goodness. did. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't walk, you know, even walking in pain, I couldn't get her to go in a wheelchair. And I, I tried to say, oh, just sit. We'll make it fun. Nope. Not having it. Like, I guess that offended her dignity or something. And it was just so frustrating because it was literally like step, step, wince. Oh, ow. You know, it really hurts. And so she refused to do the x-ray the first time. We finally basically forced it on her the second time because mm -hmm. we got into the x-ray room and she was all in agreement. I kept telling her, oh, you know, it. We're going to figure out why it's hurting so bad. It wasn't hurting bad before. Now it's hurting bad. So just, you know, that whole repetition. Right, right. We, and she kind of slept a couple minutes while we were waiting, fell asleep in the chair, probably because she was in pain and not sleeping well. And when she woke up and we went in, she's like, no, we don't need to do this. I'm like, I did not rearrange my chiropractor appointment and rearrange my freaking day for you to tell me no again. Uh-uh. So I got her to stand up and I put my foot next to her foot and i literally pivoted her and just plunked her down on the table which of course did not make her happy she was so angry at me she wouldn't talk to me i'm like that's fine we're getting this x-ray done and it was funny because the x-ray technician either has experienced people like my mom or has cared for somebody with alzheimer's mm -hmm. because 
that woman, as soon as I got my mom like on the table, she kind of like repositioned my mom real quickly and literally hit the button to push the on, you know. <laughs> I mean, like, no x ray, you know, no lead vest for me. It's like, well, Let's I just got x ray too. Quick. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciated yeah. that because I'm like, you know, I appreciate that they want to make sure that I am protected. I'm not having, you know, excessive radiation. But I was so thrilled that she, she was, she knew it was like mom versus me. And mom went out on that one. And that was okay. The only problem was they x-rayed her hips. They told me, oh, it was normal arthritis. I said, no, mm -mm, that's not the, that's not what's going on here. No. Normal arthritis does not flare up overnight after a fall. Well, when she fell the second time in March last year, they, they had to do a CT scan to find the broken bones in her leg. And that's when mm -hmm. they found the healing fracture on her pelvis. And see, that's the same thing that happened with Helen. She had a fracture, but we couldn't, she hadn't fallen. The reason why she got a fracture was because when she was sitting in the, in the, in her recliner, because the chair was so low, she flopped in it mm. and the consistent flopping caused the fracture in the hip. So that's not sad. Only, yeah. So they had to put cement in her. Yes, honey. Yes. I have a. I have an implant, a metal plate on my collarbone from the uh, launching myself off my bicycle, which well, that probably wasn't a big deal, but the slamming <laughs> into the pavement was a problem. And sometimes it's annoying. You know, the muscle gets tight if I do right. an exercise or sleep on it weird. Oh, I can only imagine cement. No, thank you, sister. Mm -mm. But, but that was the only way they could stop the pain. And once they put it oh. in within 72 hours... You know, and, and, and we got her a gift, you know, the, the lift chair. We got rid of the other chair. And, you know, you know, you know, that's another thing we have to remember is that, you know, those chairs that they sit in all they they need to be the recliner lift chairs where either they can recline their legs up. And it also helps them stand up because that constant pounding can also cause a fracture. And I never even thought about that. I'm like, this woman hasn't fallen in my care. I don't know what's going on. And when the nurse came out and looked at to see what was going on, she said, it's from her plopping in this chair. I mean, immediately she figured it out. That's funny. And see, that's another good thing about telehealth. You know, you know, we could say she hasn't fallen, but if they don't come out and actually look and see what her daily activities were, we would have never figured out that was the cause and we needed to get her another chair. Or we would have been in the same problem as before. Because now we got the, you know, it's fixed, but she's still plopping in the chair. The chair was just entirely too low. I believe it. So when you say they came out, so they actually physically came to her house. The, the, the doctor came out to her house and, you know, just wanted to do, you know, they said, we're going to start telehealth. We want to come out and visit. Uh, also, too, we want to see, you know, what's going on. The reason why you're having the problem with the, with the hip. And she said, this is it right here. She said, you getting out of the, in and out of this chair. And, and she said, how long have you had this chair? She said, oh, for about 50 or 60 years. <laughs> so she had been plopping in this chair probably for that long. Ooh, that's just, that's giving me pain. <laughs> right. So, you know, other than her saying it hurts, we were giving her Tylenol. You know, we had even gone to, you know, Tramadol. That wasn't helping. And so that's when the doctor said, well, I'm going to come out and examine her myself and see what's going on. And from there, that's how we figured out everything was going on. But that's why I said, in, in a lot of cases, not all, but in a lot of cases, telehealth can be good to catch those things that we as a family or, or even as caregivers would not even think of. Sometimes you need an outside neutral eye to see what's going on because we are so close to the situation and, you know, particularly when you know that this client hasn't fallen, why is she in so much pain? We can't, you know, you think that's arthritis. We're giving you arthritis medicine. and that's not help. We're putting Bengay, BioFreeze, ice, key. I mean, we are doing the gamut. <laughs> and she's still in pain. Well, yeah, she's in pain because she got a fracture. That's crazy. So how do we find one of these telehealth versus, well, not versus, but the what you're talking about is like a combination of telehealth and concierge, because after all of this incident with my mom falling and they took her to the ER and they she ended up at the ER before they could 
contact me. Somehow they had an old phone number, which was a little frustrating, but stuff happens. And I have no idea. Like, there was nobody there to advocate for my mom, and I found that really frustrating. And then she ended up with this, what looked like a one inch in circumference, it looked like a giant pimple right under her oh. eye, touching like the bottom eyelashes. And of course, you know, that happens on Christmas, right? <laughs> never, <laughs> never happens when it's convenient. So I take her to, well, we took her to the eat, not to, we took her to urgent care. They said they needed to drain it. And I said, you know, they couldn't do it there. They tried to find an ophthalmologist. Of course, you know, the day after Christmas, nobody's working. Of course and not. So we end up at the ER. And when I checked her in, I said, look, we've already been at the, the urgent care. She has advanced Alzheimer's. Her tolerance for waiting is zilch. I said, the longer we sit here, the less cooperative she's going to be. She's already not being very cooperative. The gal literally looked at me and then looked back at the computer and rolled her eyes. And I'm like, this is not going to go well. So, I, you know, and it's like, I get it. You know, she wasn't in some sort of crisis. They wanted me to hold her down while they drained her. I'm like, nope, not happening. Because my mom was, she was a scratcher. And I'm like, I'm not doing that to her. Just, I'm not going to be the person um, to do that because she knows me as to be the person that generally takes her fun places. And in the last week, that week, I had been taking her to all the unfun places. So I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. We're just leaving. So we left. It did finally burst. We got cream. So that was early Jan, you know, late December, early January last year. Mm -hmm. And I went to, the State Advocacy Day with the Alzheimer's Association in early February. The only thing I did out of town last year, and our team leader, our advocacy team leader said, you need to contact a concierge doctor. I'm like, I, th I thought that was just a TV show. You know, I, thought that was, I thought that was Royal Pains, or I think that's what it was oh called. My God, and I said, I said, I didn't know they had such a thing. And she goes, yeah, Ooh. we had it for my mother-in-law who lived in Southern California. And she says it was a little expensive. I think it was like at the time, $6,000 a year. And I'm like, my mom can, well, no, she, the, my team leader said, your mom can afford that. I'm like, okay, glad you're, glad you're up on my mom's finances. <laughs> and it was true. My mom could have, it would have been an expense, but it would have been worth it. So I called around and called around and the only well, there's a place called Heels, H-E-A-L-S, mm -hmm. but they don't service like the suburbs. I'm like, I'm like 45 miles northeast of San Francisco, but they don't come out this far. And then there was one other place. It was $1,500 a visit. I'm like, yeah, no, uh-uh. Mom's got money, yeah. but that ain't there, happening. There are some that are pricey. The first ones that I came in contact with was called Visiting Physicians. Oh, my God. Fabulous. Fabulous, 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 fabulous. That sounds like a five plus stars there. <laughs> <laughs> they were the first ones that I came in contact with maybe more than six or seven years ago. And when I tell you that they were all over Northeast Florida, um, Northeast Florida is considered like four or five counties. And they had enough people to go to all of these counties. And that was my first contact with them. Now. Uh, United Health and, and the other uh, insurance companies, depending on what state you live in, now have a concierge service. After last and, year? Yeah, well, and, and, yeah, more because of last year, but they were already starting even prior to COVID because Miss Helen, as I always, you know, I talk about Miss Helen, Miss Helen had it prior to COVID, but then it became even more important when COVID, and I'm glad she had it because we would have been in a pickle particularly because of the medication she's on, because some of the medication requires a doctor visit every 90 days. Mm. So instead of us having to hoist her, you know, pull the car up to the front, leave the car there, then go back in and get her. And, you know, the, the doctor had to come in versus us having to go to her. So it was a good thing, you know, during before COVID. But then even during COVID, because medication, getting that medication renewed was such, uh, it, it had to be continued. You just keep them on a routine. You know, if you miss medicine, sometimes with a, a person of age, it, it, it impacts the care. 
it's 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 hard on us because you know some of it takes care of their behavioral issues, some of it takes care of their incontinent issues, <laughs> some of it takes care of their appetite issue. You know, so so there's a, a a lot of things that are really good that have come out of the concierge. You, you know, and particularly for those people who have caregivers staying with their loved ones. So, you know, so, you know, it, it like I said, it reduces the opportunity for falls and safety and, and stress and being overwhelmed, all of that. But then on the other side, too, you know, we have to look at to make sure that we become so attached to this that we isolate our loved one from going outside. Definitely. No, I can see. I have a geriatrician that speaks on the podcast almost monthly, and she makes house calls. I don't think that it's like for everybody, but she has a similar case to what you're talking about with Miss Helen, a gentleman that was in her care was having a lot of falls. And she went through all of her testing and checking the medications and all of the stuff that she's talked to my audience about. And that wasn't solving the problem. So she went to his house. Now, this gentleman was a retired antiques dealer. So he had area rugs layered over other area rugs. Which oh. I'm, telling, I'm telling you, my balance is very good. That would be a tripping hazard for me. My biggest concern of my house, I trip over dog toys. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of them are very hard plastic because I got golden retrievers. So we got the super chewers. Right. So I, I generally try to look for the dog toys and move them out of the path so I don't kick them with my poor toes. Because <laughs> those, exactly. those things are hard and heavy. Mm -hmm. You don't want to break any toes. So the other issue with this gentleman's house, besides six area rugs, was he had like beautifully curated things in corners or on the edges of like the couch. So instead right. of a table that you might be able to catch yourself on if you're falling. This would be like books and, and you know, t you know, silver tea sets and other, you know, beautiful antiques, wow. but they're certainly not going to catch your fall. They might even actually make it worse. You can only imagine landing on a teapot or a coffee pot. No. Exactly. And she, that's how she fixed his situation. And so I definitely think as we age, we need to kind of inspect people's environments because, you know, our vision you know, doesn't usually get better with age. And we get into maybe we get into a rut and we don't change things. We don't none of us wants to admit that we need to, like, you know, move the dog toys before you turn the lights off at night and walk across the room to go to bed. Yes. Because, <laughs> you know, you step on that bone and it's poof, not fun, you know, but it's. You know, and I, I always make sure the stairs are clear of toys, too. They're pretty good about keeping, they don't play on the stairway. But, you know, these right. are things we have to always consider. And if somebody's memory is not as good, then they might not, they might not see it. They might not, you know, like you said, you had no clue the chair was the problem. That just blows my mind. You know? <laughs> because, because when you think of a fracture, you normally think of a slip or a fall. You never think of sitting in a chair that's too low. Because you don't sit properly after so much sit flopping, you know, because we, a lot of times when we sit, we don't sit gracefully. We do flop. Especially, <laughs> especially if we're tired. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a flopper. I'm truly a flopper. And so, you know, with that, you know, con you know, with that consistent pounding and pounding, that's what happened. And it's the little things a lot of times that we don't think of, like I said earlier, that, you know, sometimes we need a, an additional eye. Um, the concierge services, you know, look at them not not as the primary way of taking care of, of your mother, but if it's a secondary way, like say, for instance, if she's really weak or she can't walk, these may be the times when you need the concierge services. You know, um, if it's, you know, getting difficult to get her in and out of the car, you know, different things like that. Uh, yeah. Now, there may be a time when, you know, when you do have to take them to the hospital, you know, we don't have a choice. But if 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 we can make it as comfortable as possible, you know, things like blood work, let the concierge come in and do that. Yeah. Instead of taking them out. My mom, at, in the later stages when we had a lot more doctor visits, I think she would have been a lot more cooperative had they mm -hmm. come to her. 
You know, it could have oh, been like, okay. yeah, because I know we had, ooh, you have to scrape the rust off this brain cell. There was a <laughs> nurse, I guess it was through her health care. Ooh. They kept bugging me about like a, a nurse that would go, I think, twice a year. Wasn't it wasn't more than four times. I think it was twice a year. And basically check blood pressure, do all the basics. And they always they always like called and left a message or sent me a letter like right after we were at the doctor for whatever reason. So I avoided it until mid twenty nineteen. And we it had been enough time that I thought, let's just give this a try. And, you know, it wasn't a real comprehensive visit, but at least the gal was, she came into the the residence, she saw my mom, and my mom was really cool with it. You know, it was, it was mm-hmm. just kind of like another person, you know, um, she didn't object to the blood pressure, which at the doctor's office she always did. You know, it was, she talked to me. It was it was really good. So now I'm going to have to check. I wasn't really fond of her healthcare system. Out mm-hmm. of the three we have in our area, it's definitely third. And then the other two kind of battle each other for first and second. And now I'm going to have to check and see what what kind of options those three systems have. Because it would have been really nice. Because I asked the doctor like the third time we needed to do um, a urine test, you know, because the care staff kept saying, well, we think your mom's got a u- urinary tract infection. They'd call me up kind of like in a panic. And I'd be like, I was just there like 12 hours ago or 24 hours ago. And she was fine. I think we're okay. But I got to the point where I knew it was like, I'm just going to wait a day or two. And if it gets Ooh. worse, then I know we need to do something. But if it doesn't get worse, that's not the problem. Because we kept, you know, dashing off to the doctor's office and you know you can't just hand my mom a specimen cup and say okay now little let a little out then pee and then th- <laughs> i have trouble doing that once it's going it's going so oh, gosh. you know it's like i mean i don't have any cognitive problems and i have a problem you know with i mean i can do it but it's not easy and so we always had to put the hat in the bowl, which she objected right. to. It was always a thing. All kind of and, things. And the staff was like, every time they'd be, they'd like, oh, well, here, we'll give you the specimen cup. I'm like, uh-uh, honey. We oh, no, that honey. Once. <laughs> we ain't doing that again. My mom is a scratcher and a Ooh. smacker. You piss her off and she going, she, whoo, no, no, I'm not, I'm not getting down on the floor in front of her because that could be seriously ugly. And I asked them once, I'm like, can you just give me the stuff? I will go to where she's at and collect the urine. Or I'll have the care staff collect the urine. Oh, no, no. Blah, blah, blah. Excuses, excuses. And I'm thinking. But you know what though? They let us collect it. That's they just, do. Uh, we, have a, we have a bag of cups. <laughs> and <laughs> just like a little grocery bag. We have a bag of cups. We have the lip. We have the little thing that you mark, the little paper, you know, where you seal it. And then you put it in another bag. And then, you know, we have to sit it in the refrigerator. You know, we have a special place where the food didn't go where we put the urine, okay, because we don't want it to get mixed up with apple juice. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> I hope nobody's oh. listening to this while they're eating. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, that's, you know, they, you know, now they're more flexible in allowing the care staff, you know, with us. But I want to talk about one more uh, pro and one more con. The pro for telehealth medicine, particularly those people who live in rural areas, trying to pack up and drive all the way into the doctor's office. Because sometimes in rural areas, people don't have transportation. Mm -hmm. They don't have Uber. They don't have buses. Or they may not have cars at all or no one who can come out and come and get them. So for rural areas, this is great. That's That's the pro. Now that another con is, is that a lot of the elderly don't have internet. Yeah, we need to fix that. <laughs> I, I'm just, you know, I'm, 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 I'm saying this is because, yeah, we're looking at one side, but, but also, too, let's look at the other side. You know, a lot of, excuse me, barely have cell phones. If they have cell phones, I didn't even know they still made flip phones until I saw someone with a flip phone the other day. I said, does this belong in the Smithsonian Institute <laughs> or what? <laughs> Well, it's funny because you you mentioned that I like I said I live forty five minutes northeast of San Francisco forty five minutes well it's about forty five minutes forty five miles about sixty miles north 
ish. I guess it's mostly straight north. I'm not. I'm a little directionally challenged. Right. Silicon Valley. You know, tech tech world. I live in a town that is 15 square miles. I have super high speed internet right here. I go two miles that away south southeast. We hmm. have satellite internet, which is one step above dial up. Now, I don't even remember the last time I had dial-up, and I'm not doing dial-up. I couldn't do what we're doing now with dial-up. I can't do it with satellite. And the reason I know this, because I was shocked when I learned it, we're trying to, we would like to buy an acre of property and put two houses on it. And oh. most of those lots are over in the edge of town where the agriculture, this is, was, is still is, but it was all agricultural. And in the late 80s on through today, it's now a giant, not giant, but it's a, it's a town of 67,000 people. That's basically a suburb of Oakland, Berkeley, and San Francisco. But we have satellite internet. I didn't even know that was a thing. So all the places that we like that we can put two houses on are in what I refer to as the crappy internet zone. So that's a no-go because the two houses, one would be for us, one would be for my daughter and son-in-law, and they're 30 and 35. So there's no way in hell those two millennials are living without good quality internet. <laughs> and I can guarantee, yeah, I guarantee you part of the reason we don't have broadband out there is because the farmers didn't want it, don't want to contribute to putting it in, didn't need it, blah, blah, blah. Don't, you know, we've been doing it like this since 1850. Guess what? It's 2021. You know, there's a lot of migrant farmers' children and the the Latin families that I don't know how the hell they did school during COVID because one, you have four kids. Most of us don't have four computers and they had crappy internet. So a lot of them, I don't know what they were doing. I just know it was a nightmare. So I'm hoping we know the county supervisor, she lives out here. Our county is sort of separated mm -hmm. by a big mountain. So it's like, let's push for... Everybody needs broadband. I don't care what these farmers think they need or want. It just it's time. So and, it's and, 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 and like you said, that goes back to in the rural areas, people don't have internet. And even in the city, we still have a lot of seniors that don't have the internet. They barely have cable, hmm. you know, just to keep them occupied. Most of it's them expensive. don't even and it's and and it's so it's not a priority. You know, after you get a certain age, that internet should be free. This is this is just me talking. I, you know, I don't argue with that. You know, particularly for the telehealth, because at some point in time, you know, we're hitting ten thousand baby boomers a day are hitting retirement and Social Security. We're going to need to put an infrastructure in place to handle that, and we don't have it. We don't have it. Mm -mm. And yeah, you know, we're very behind on that. We're very behind. And there's still a lot of people that live in rural areas. They're, you know, they're still, you know, everybody didn't move to the city. Everybody didn't move to the city. I'm just, I'm just saying. And so there are a lot of people who are living in the city that are moving to rural areas or moving to the mountains. We've got to have something to keep them safe so far as their medical part. You know, so, you know, again, we've talked about a lot of pros and cons, but I know, you know, you know, I, I think about the rural area. I think about the Internet piece. But at the end of the day, we have options. And that's a good thing. We've moved forward in options. But we have we don't have the infrastructure for the options. So we need to fight for that. That's kind of one of my pet projects is I tweet at some of the legislators that don't seem to understand that our economy needs to help support caregivers, child care workers elder care workers, family caregivers. If we want a full and robust economy. We need to help those people. We can't just say infrastructure is only ridges, ridges, <laughs> bridges, roads, you know, internet, whatever. Right. Right. That's important too. However, they're going to have to be doing a lot of infrastructure now. I guess there's like roads melting in the upper Northwest here. It's hysterical in Seattle. It's like 115 degrees. And it's supposed to be like 88 here today, which is... wow. You know, awesome. it's on the cooler side of our typical hot summer, which I hope that makes sense. It Usually does. upper 80s into the upper 90s is normal. So 88 on the low end of normal. <laughs> so I love 88. <laughs> I'm all good for that. I feel sorry for the people in Seattle. And I'm hoping it cools down because we're going on a road trip 
up the coast into Oregon and Washington. And we were thinking we we're going to have to pack two seasons of clothes, but now I'm not sure we're going to have to do that. So it'll be interesting. But yeah, it's like, you know, I don't understand how anybody can say, you know, we want these these women to go back to work because we our economy needs it. However, they justify that. I'm not too certain how that works, but whatever. Mm. So we need child care. And I've talked to companies that are seriously starting to, to consider a combination child and elder care, which would be fantastic because you got the older people dealing with the little kids and the little kids entertaining the older people. I mean, it's all good. You know, you might we have, have, to- we have a, yeah, yeah, we have a program here where the elderly people are in a daycare with children helping to take, you know, so it's kind of twofold. But, you know, again, as we talk about infrastructure, we have 70% of the United States that doesn't have enough CNAs. I think it's, it's a more shortage. Than 70. It's it's a shortage of CNAs. And then and then your nurses that have been working for 30, 35 years are retiring by droves. And that infrastructure is weak because now once they get done, a lot of them are saying, okay, I don't even want to teach. I just want I just want to fade into the into the sunset. Go on, take a nap. <laughs> Especially <laughs> well, after those, COVID. Yes, I take a nap every day for two hours. I, I, I did implement a nap. But at the end of the day, we have infrastructure problem. It's a good thing, telehealth. We talked about the pros and cons. But at the end of the day, we have to have some type of legislation that will help us at least tackle this or reduce the problems that we have, or they'll get worse because of all the baby boomers that are hitting the social security rolls, 10,000 a day. Yeah, that's scary. I'm a Gen X, Gen X. Yeah. I have to think about it because I get confused sometimes and refer to myself as Gen Y. It's like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not that young. <laughs> but I'm I on the old, old end of Gen X. Right. So I'll okay. be 55 this year, the end of this year. Um, I do not get social security until I'm 67 and a half. But I would get Medicare at 65. So I got a little bit over 10 years. And it's scary. It's like, um, I really hope that a lot of these problems get solved before I need all of this extra help because it was bad with my mom. I don't really want to deal with it with me. And now my husband's on blood thinners for the rest of his life because of his um, blood clots in his lungs. You know, it's just, it's like... You know, thankfully we have technology. I was harassing him mercilessly because he ordered a <laughs> blood pressure machine. And I'm like, hello, we are not old people. I am not old people. And now he's taking my blood pressure twice since we've gotten it. Thankfully it's all good. You know, I was checking my heart rate on my Apple watch today because like I said, I'm waiting for the doctor to call me. I think we made it through this recording. No interruption. And, yeah. you know, so, cause when he had his, his issue before Memorial Day, his watch was going, dude, something's wrong. This is, wow. this is weird. Yeah, his watch actually went off. And oh um, yeah, it's like, it's a good thing it went off, but it's also not, it's like, uh, right. what the heck do I do about this? So, you know, we have technology that kind of, you know, I could, when I talked to the advice nurse, I said, you know, my heart rate is up higher but then it comes down, but then it goes up, and I'm just sitting still. It's like something is funky. I feel a little weird, you know. Got some. I think my husband gave me his his blood clots. I know they're not contagious, but something is going on. So it's, like, <laughs> you know, and it's fine. You know, they asked me if I was okay with a telehealth appointment. I said, yeah, I did one of those. She did a good job on diagnosing what was going on with my ears, which I thought was amazing because you know I did not press my ear up to the camera on my computer. And, you know, it's just, there's a lot of things that are, you know, beneficial. It was really nice to be able to just talk to the advice nurse from home, talk to the doctor from my computer between advocacy calls back when we were doing those in May, March, mm. May. I forgot now. Let, let me March. tell you about keeping, keeping up with your, your blood pressure and your heart rate and your pulse. Going back to Miss Helen, Miss <laughs> Helen's uh, uh, pulse was just all over the place. And so we have been monitoring it for, you know, since we, you know, be, became our caregiver. But but we noticed in the last month or two, it really was, you know, like a yo-yo. 
And so the, the nurse came in. She said, OK, we're going to monitor it for another for a week and call me back. Well, I called them with the numbers. And by the time I had called her with the numbers within an hour, she called and said, we got to change her medicine because her medicine was too strong. And that was what was causing the, the up and down, up and down. Now, as soon as we changed the medicine within 72 hours, that pulse rate normal, normal, normal. So telehealth is good because what if we had to, okay, take those sheets in, let her look at them, you know, all of this. You no, know, all we had to do was call it in to the nurse. Then, you know, she looked at it, gave it to the doctor. The doctor said this, yes, let's, let's lower this medicine. So it saved us a lot of time. It saved us a lot of time. What if we couldn't have gotten in for another month or two? And that medicine, she was still taking that medicine. What additional damage or problems could it have caused? Yeah. Because uh, we had to wait 30 days to get in. I'm just saying, so, you know, I'm just talking about another pro to it, you know. And then I also want to make sure that people that really good journal information about, you know, if when they take the insulin, what the insulin levels are, what the blood pressure, all this is important. All this is so important when it comes not only to maintaining your health and making sure you're healthy, but then also to with telehealth. I believe it. Yeah, there's technology and stuff is not it's not a bad thing. You know, like right. I, people say, like, I can't believe like you're you're paying attention to your watch. And I'm like, well, my heart rate is higher than it should be right now. And, you know, we were out on a bike ride this morning. I'm like, my heart rate is 123 beats per minute, which is high, considering we're riding about 10 miles an hour on a flat road. Like my heart is not pounding, but I'm looking at my watch because I, you know, and I know myself, I'm old enough to know that, yes, I feel funky and I'm not ignoring it because right. I'm old enough now right. to know that some, my body is trying to tell me something. I just haven't figured out what. Hopefully, it's And what's nothing. so good about technology is, is that we used to ignore those things about my body. Oh, it's just hot outside or, oh, I'm just getting old, but it's more than it's hot outside and it's more than I'm just getting old. This technology helps us, you know, detect early a problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's my a, husband, if he had not my gone. Those are final words. <laughs> if my husband had not gone to the doctor the Thursday before Memorial Day, probably would be dead because he went out for a walk with the dogs. His exercise routine was to take the two golden retrievers, walk about two and a quarter miles very quickly. He's like six two, so I don't walk with him because I would have to run and I don't run. <laughs> Uh, it's just not happening. Like the bear can eat me, but I'm not gonna, I'm not running away from the bear. I'll just be lunch. That's what I always tell people because it's just, I'm not running. It's not going to do me any good. And he came home. So obviously his heart rate was elevated. He came home within 30 to 45 seconds. It dropped significantly. And after a minute or two, it was normal. Everything was fine. He was at my uh, grandmother's house cleaning up stuff to get it ready to put on the market. And he bent over to wrap the cord around the shop vac, got very dizzy. And that's when his watch Ooh. started saying, woohoo, pay attention, something's going on here. He sat down, he said, and he couldn't catch his breath. And he's like, crap, I've been through this before. I know what this means. He came home. He told me he wasn't feeling great. He says, I'm, my heart rate's really high. I'm just going to chill on the couch. And I'm like, you probably need to go to the doctor. He's like, I don't want to go to the doctor, <laughs> which is what we all say. Okay. And I did a recording like we've been doing. I went downstairs. He said, my heart rate has not changed. I said, dude, it's the Thursday. It's Thursday evening before, you know, holiday weekend. All day. We need to go because it's going to be ugly in the ER if we don't go. And because exactly. he could tell them, you know, this is the information that's on my watch. You know, it it was more believable. So, yes. you know, utilizing technology, telehealth, it's all a good thing. The more we know, the more we can advocate for ourselves and our loved ones. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, this has been great. I'm sure we'll awesome. do something again soon. Of course we will. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blow away in any hurricanes or anything over there. We'll try not to melt or burn up over here on the West Coast. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. little... I'm, creating, I'm creating, I'm creating some info. Well, I, I have some information out now for seniors for hurricane, but I'm putting out some more things about, you know, 
the little meals you can make in case your power goes out. So, you know, that's, those are the type of things I'm working on. Yeah. Oh, good. Send me that information when you get it and I'll share it on my website too. Cause that sounds sure. really helpful. Yes, you ma'am. Know, I sure will. For p- people who don't want to like cook everything on the barbecue. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. I appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Yes, ma'am. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.